Father, we want to thank you for your presence here this morning. Lord, our heart and our minds are challenged by the enemy in so many ways to be distracted and take our focus off of you. And Lord, we, we come and we quiet our hearts now before you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd sweep through this place this morning. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and move in our midst. We invite you to have your way with our hearts. That every thought that we entertain, Lord, would bring honor to you. And every word that comes out of our, our mouth would come from the depths of our heart in thanksgiving and adoration and worship of who you are. Lord, we come with gratitude that we were able to wake up this morning and we can breathe and we can say, we love you, Lord. We praise you for who you are. Help us to recognize who you really are in every aspect of our life, Lord. Those things we've not given over to you, we give them to you now. And Lord, as Pastor prayed this morning that you'd put a finger on those things in our hearts that are causing us to stumble. Cleanse us, God. Cleanse us. And Lord, we ask that you would just have your way, that our hearts would honor you and you would be glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Now, little information before we start to worship. We're not going to have words up here this morning, okay? So if you enjoy Mark's talents and abilities, this is a time just to just worship God. You know, you turn on the music in the radio, on the radio in the car, and you can worship along with that, and maybe you're singing, maybe you're catching all the words, maybe you're catching some of the words. It's going to be like that this morning, okay? So I want you to not worry about what words aren't up here. This is a time to take a focus and put your eyes on God and just close your eyes. Don't worry about what's going on around you and worship the Lord, okay? So, Father, thank you for giving us that strength, that opportunity just to shut everything down in our eyes and to look to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the song is called Sing My Love. Just express uh, your love to God in whatever way you want to. All right, praise the Lord. Touches me, he burns right through me, and I could not forget every word he said. He always knew me, and earth could never hold this love that burns my soul. Heaven holds me. Sing, sing my love, I can't hold back my prayer. 
sing, sing my love. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. My soul makes, makes its boast in the Lord. Oh, praise. Oh. in the Lord can't hold back my praise I can't hold my praise back from you I can't hold my praise back from you I gotta sing I gotta sing sing my praise I love you Jesus oh I can't hold my praise back from you hold my praise back from you I gotta sing I gotta sing sing my love oh praise the Lord oh praise the Lord my soul makes makes its boast in the Lord oh praise oh praise the It's both in the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Son, perfect. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned but suffered as if he did. He never sinned but suffered as if he did. And all authority and all authority, every victory. in power. Jesus, awesome in power forever. Awesome and great is your name. For you overcame power in hand. Power in hand. Speaking the Father's plan. Sending us out, light in this broken land. All of Every victory is yours, and all authority. Every victory is your Savior, Savior, you're worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise, for you overcame. 
overcame, you overcame, Jesus, awesome in power, Jesus, you're awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name, for you overcame. We serve a conquering Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Conqueror, healer. Thank you, Lord.
hopeless have found their hope. The hopeless have found their hope. The orphans now have a home. And all that was lost has found its place in you. And you lived our weary head. You make us strong instead. You took these rags and made it beautiful for all. Oh, for all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. affection, our devotion. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, we love you. Oh, how the God of second chances. Oh, how we love you. And you are the one our hearts, our hearts adore. Oh, our affection, our affection. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for out on I don't deserve it oh our affection I don't deserve you oh pour it out we pour it out we pour it out on you our affection our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one our hearts our hearts adore We love you. Thank 
Thank you, Jesus. Oh, how we love you. And you are the one our hearts, our hearts adore. Oh, you're the God of second chances. How we don't deserve you, Lord. Jesus, before we, before we open our mouths and tell you all that we need and all that we want, Lord, we want to open our mouths and say, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. We pour out our affection and our devotion at your feet. Jesus, we love you. For who you are, for what you've done, for your goodness to us, for forgiving our sins, for filling us with your spirit for drawing near to us. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for gathering with us this morning. Would you peer, would you peer into our hearts this day? Would you show us, allow us to see all that you have for us, all that you are for us. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, all of the house churches and leaders that have been raised up in the last 20 years, and Lord, our hearts are heavy, but we thank you for your presence there with them. Would you, would you draw near? Would you protect them? Father, would you protect our brothers and sisters in harm's way? As they cry out to you and love on one another, Lord, we're all upset we don't have song lyrics. <laughs> Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who, whose faith is truly tested. And would you keep them strong? Would you strengthen their hearts? And whatever purpose you've got for your church, in Afghanistan today. Lord, would you allow your church to, to step out, step up, and, and trust you, trust you in the midst of it. Lord, may we, may we take a, a cue from our brothers and sisters in the Middle East and stand for you in the midst of whatever we face. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you've got your hand on this world. That we sure don't, but you sure do. We trust you. Lord, we trust you with the affairs of men. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather, for receiving our worship. We thank you for it all. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Hey, the book of James, it's uh, good for us to be back with you this morning. Thank you for allowing Donna and I to get away last weekend. Uh, for our anniversary, and thank you, Brian, for bringing the message, and uh, thank you all for your faithfulness, and we appreciate you letting us get away for a weekend. We come in our study of the book of James to James chapter 4. You can look at the first six verses, but I want to launch from uh, perhaps familiar words to many of us from Proverbs chapter 4. Verse 23, Proverbs 4.23. It says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Now, Father, we thank you for the amazing work you do on our hearts. They sure do need it. Thank you for your constant encouragement for us to watch our hearts. And may we take that instruction to heart this morning, to keep an eye on our hearts. And Father, would you, would you instruct us, would you challenge us, would you encourage us from your word this morning? Thank you for the words that you put in James' mouth and his pen. 
Lord, they are so relevant for today. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heart, watch your heart with all diligence. The way I memorize that verse in the New American Standard Version, watch your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart with all vigilance. The condition of our heart dictates how we interact with God, how we interact with others, how we interact with the issues of life. The condition of our hearts dictates every relationship in our lives and how we interact with the issues of life. So God says, carefully, carefully watch your heart. Watch where your heart goes. Watch what your heart is exposed to. Watch how your heart responds to various situations. We might call it spiritual self-awareness. Why do I do the things I do? Why do I think the things that I do? Is it because the way I was brought up, the way my parents did things, the way I was conditioned in my upbringing? Is it because my peers all do this or that or encourage me to do this or that? Is it I do what I do because God wants me to? We would be wise to look at our hearts and understand why it is we do the things we do. Watch your heart with all vigilance. Keep your heart with all diligence. James is going to deal with that as we come now to chapter 4, letter of James. Chapter 3 uh, ended uh, two weeks ago. We looked at wisdom from above and wisdom from below. The wisdom from below is, is arrogant and self-centered, self-serving, proud, Wisdom from above is righteous, it is pure, it is peaceable, it is reasonable. And now James is going to begin to deal a little more fully with the fruit of worldly wisdom. Entitled this message, The Root of the Problem. The Root of the Problem. Or could have called it The Heart of the Problem. And the Heart of the Problem is the problem of the heart, right? So watch our hearts. James is going to deal with an issue in his church that was indeed a matter of the heart. So I want to look at three things because that's what I always do. Number one, they are in conflict with others. Let me just read through all six verses and then we'll go back and kind of pick them up. James chapter 4. What causes quarrels among you? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people. Ouch. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says, He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us, but He gives more grace. Whew. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. First thing we see there is we are in conflict with others. We're in conflict with others. The first part of verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? James picks, paints this picture of war in the church, not war on the church. We spend a lot of time talking about war on the church and, and uh, push back against biblical values and biblical morality. James paints a picture of war in the church. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Not a war on the church. Again, as we look at Afghanistan, amongst other places today, we see there is certainly war on the church, but James addresses war in the church. James doesn't say stop fighting. James asks the question, 
Why are you fighting? What's causing you to fight? What's causing you to quarrel amongst yourselves? The cause is beneath the surface. Churches should not have a sign out front that says, enter at your own risk. Right? They should have a sign out front that says, the peace of God, the wisdom of God resides here. God help us to make that sign reality, right? God's wisdom, God's peace resides here. Apparently, as we look thus far in James' letter, apparently, it seems like there are some that are pushing the idea uh, in the church that, that they ought to pursue worldly approval and, and social acceptance, and, and we, need to, we need to quit being those that are looked down on, and we need to, to be more embraced by the culture above their Christian witness, social status above godly character. And there was kind of a quarrel going on there as we, we kind of piece that together from uh, chapter 2, chapter 3. Those who uh, want to uh, be recognized for their status in the community and, and perhaps there was fighting, bickering going on. Like, w we need to be upstanding. God calls us to be witnesses, right? So, first thing we... We'll look at this first part of verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? First, it's not God's design. It's not God's design for people, for God's people to be fighting among themselves. It's not God's design. God's design is unity, right? Unity around biblical truth. Hear this. Christian unity is not the same thing as common decency. We are to express common decency to everybody, right? Regardless of what they think or how they view life, what their worldview is, we are to extend common decency. Christian unity is something specifically different than that. It is unity around the truth of God's Word. Christian unity isn't, ah, do whatever you want to do, and that's fine. Christian unity is believers uh, embracing Biblical truth and encouraging others to one another to embrace biblical truth. Does that make sense? Biblical, biblical unity is not the same thing as common decency. We need to express common decency to everybody. Christian unity is God's people gathered around God's word, lifting up God's standards, right? Church at Corinth, all kinds of problems, all kinds of bickering inside. Paul says to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I exhort you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that there be no divisions among you, but that you will be of the same mind and same judgment. The same mind and same judgment. The same convictions that you'd be united around the convictions of God's word, right? The same mind, same judgment. Reminded of Jesus' words in John 17, verses 20, 21. Jesus is praying for believers of all time that they would be one, that they would all be one. Father, as you and I are one, may they be one. And in those familiar words in Psalm 133, verse 1, how pleasant, how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Unity is not just do whatever you want, think whatever you want. Biblical unity is God's people rallied around God's word, God's standards, right? And encouraging ourselves to, to walk in God's standards, encouraging one another to walk in God's standards. With grace, right? With grace. A wisdom from above. As, as James wrote in chapter 3, verse 17, wisdom that from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, sincere. We looked at that last week. That's God's design, that we would walk in unity. And secondly, unfortunately, it is often man's reality. Disunity is often man's reality. Again, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, first few verses. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. 
and even now you are not re yet ready. For you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Too often, disunity, conflict with one another is the reality in the church. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20, Paul has to say this, For I fear that perhaps when I come I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. Too often, that is a testimony of God's people. Should not be. We shouldn't have to put up a sign in front of a church that says, enter at your own risk. We should be able to put up a sign that says, God's peace, God's grace, God's wisdom resides here. Wisdom from below. As, again, James has laid out for us in the, the end of chapter 3, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition that was going on. When two parties are, are just striving for their own way, there's going to be innocent bystanders who are hurt and confused and discouraged, right? When there's two parties that in God's, amongst God's people, uh, that they both want their own way, they will not budge, innocent people are going to be hurt. The question is, do we even care? Do we even care? Or is getting our way, getting my way, more important than somebody else's spiritual health, somebody else's well-being, somebody else's growth, right? Somebody else's needs. How many times have people walked into a church just seeking hope and seeking some answers only to find a family feud? That should not have happened, right? That should not have happened. We should be mature. We're going to have differences. We're going to see things differently. But we should be able to deal with those differences in a, in a mature kind of way, from, with wisdom from above, to be able to deal with things in a, in a reasonable kind of way. I remember um, pretty green, been in the Lord a year or two maybe, and we attended our first ever annual business meeting. And wonderful church. We loved it. Wonderful church. Church we spent the first five years of our marriage in. Wonderful church. And... The pastor comes out for the, the begin this annual business meeting with a hard hat on. And that was kind of his humorous way of like saying, I know this is going to be rough. And we all chuckled. And then what ensued was absolutely pathetic as, as leaders would stand up. We, we saw none of this. This was all under the surface kind of tensions. And this guy would stand up and we're paying this youth pastor way too much. And I don't like this and I don't like that. And I, at that point, was, was naive enough to think, well, this ain't the way believers ought to behave. And may I say, I'm still naive enough to believe that is not the way believers ought to behave. We're going to have differences. We bring those differences up. This is where I feel. Put things on the table, vote on them, move forward, love one another, right? And, and uh, my eyes were open to the ugly underbelly of the church that evening, that Sunday evening, 1982 or something, and um, I'd like to say that's the last time I ever saw something like that. It is not. But that is not the way mature believers, spirit-filled believers in Christ behave themselves, even when there's differences, right? Conflict with others in the church. In the church, it's not God's design. Why do we allow it to continue? We shouldn't. We should, we should check our own hearts. Conflict with others. Secondly, James addresses we're in conflict with ourselves, and there is the heart of the issue. We are in conflict with ourselves. Last part of verse 1 and 2 and 3. Is it not the cause of your quarrels and fights? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions in conflict with ourselves. People, it seems to me, people who are 
often in conflict with others, usually are in conflict with themselves. You show me someone who's at peace uh, with their own passions and they're, they're, they're able to walk with God in a way that, of self-control and you're going you're gonna, to, I'll show you somebody who, who can walk through difficult times with others. So often, people who are in conflict with others are in conflict with themselves. And James helps us to see that. I think this is absolutely true. External pressure doesn't create conflict. External pressure reveals conflict. External pressures don't create conflict. External pressure reveals conflict. We see that so often in marriage, don't we? There's money problems or there's job problems or there's kiddo problems. And those don't create conflict. Those reveal conflict. When the, when the husband and wife are in unity with one another and with the Lord, and they, work, they walk through those things. They're difficult, right? They're difficult. Those are difficult things. And yet... External pressure doesn't create conflict. External pressure reveals conflict. Does that ring true to you? I think we've all experienced that. And when we're at peace with God, we're at peace with ourselves, and the issues of life, we're able to walk in peace with those around us. So James says the problem is not external forces, and there's some external forces here. Roman leaders aren't liking them. Jewish leaders aren't liking them. There's a lot of difficulty going on. They've got financial issues, the economy. Very, very difficult to those that James is writing to. Uh, he said that the problem is not external forces. The problem is their internal passions and cravings and desires that are unchecked. The cause, James says, what is the cause? He says it's your passions, your passions. Peter said... 1 Peter 2, verse 11, uh, keep watch, paraphrase, keep watching your passions which wage war against your soul. Watch those passions that wage war against your soul. Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25, but 22, 23, uh, Paul says, in that passage, he says, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I keep doing. What is it? It's the sin that indwells me. Those passions that, that he wasn't able, apart from the Lord, he was not able to regulate. And Paul said again in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for they are in opposition to one another, one another that you may not do the things that you please. How many of us can identify with that? The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, spirit against the flesh, that may not do the things that we please. People are, are not at peace with one another because they are not at peace with themselves. They got under the surface things churning, desires that, that are unchecked. They're not watching their hearts. And so it boils over into relational conflict with others, right? James says your passions. The, the word that James uses there, the Greek word that he uses is Hedone, something very close to that, which from which we get our word hedonism. Now, hedonism is the world view that says pleasure is the goal of life. I'm just going to live my life for pleasure, and a successful life is a life filled with pleasure. May I say that is the default world view of humanity? Pleasure. We're just going to, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do what pleases me. Your passions. Hedonism. When everybody is seeking their own pleasure, the result is strife, hatred, division, right? He's already mentioned that in the last few verses of chapter 3. When everyone is watching their own hearts, there is unity, there is peace, there is fruitful ministry. When each of us are watching our hearts and not nagging one another, but nagging our own hearts, right? Like David Seek the Lord, O oh my soul. We keep an eye on our hearts. Soul, seek the Lord. Watch what you're doing. Then we can be at peace with others. In conflict with ourselves, 
So take a look at three maybe particulars that, that James sort of points to. One, our uncontrolled desires. Our uncontrolled desires. The last part of, of verse 1. Is it not that your passions are at war within you? We have two choices with those desires, passions that stir up in our hearts. We can either cultivate them or we can crucify them. We either cultivate our passions or we crucify our passions. To cultivate our passions is to say, I want to, so I will. All right? We all battle that. I want to, so I will. Yeah, I'm just going to nourish, nurture, feed this passion of mine because I want to. The desire, the passion for pleasure and power and position and popularity, much of which was going on in James Church. We want to be popular. We want to be thought of well in the community. We don't want people looking down on us. To cultivate our passions is to say, I want to, so I will, and nobody can stop me, which is the arrogant side of that thing, right? To crucify our flesh is to say, I will surrender my desires to God. God, would you show me? Are these desires, are they, are they from my sinful nature? Are they from my spirit man? To desire, to the passion for his will, for his purposes, for his glory. Today we justify our passions with one simple phrase. God made me this way. And generations gone by, people would say, I, I don't want anything to do with biblical Christianity because it seems to not like everything I like, right? Today, there's this movement, if you will, of people who say, no, we want to identify with God. We want to identify with Jesus because everybody loves Jesus. And so, well, God made me this way. So you should be good with everything I do, Right? Take that to its logical conclusion. The bank robber, the racist, the rapist, the murderer, God made me this way. That's not going to fly, right? Tell that to the judge. Your Honor, God made me this way. I, I just had to rob that bank. That's who he made me to be. I'm not quite as good at, at as I should be, I guess, because I'm standing here in front of the judge. Take that logic to its illogical conclusion. God made me this way. No, God made you in his image, and he went to great lengths to give us instructions about what that image looks like. And when, we're, when my conduct, when my passions are not in line with God's word, I had to say, oh, God, would you change my passions, right? Would you change my desire? Don't, let's not hang our sin on God, right? He, God made me this way. Now, here's, a, here's, a, here's a tough fact. Salvation doesn't cause our sinful nature to cease, right? Salvation just doesn't just make our sinful desires cease. Salvation does supply us with the wisdom and the power to rightly deal with our passions, right? To rightly deal with our sinful nature. As Paul said in Romans 8, verse 13, put to death the deeds of the flesh. Can't do that apart from the Spirit of God. Salvation doesn't make our sinful nature go away, but it does supply us with the power and the wisdom to deal with it. Uncontrolled desires. Secondly, unfulfilled desires. First part of verse 2. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You desire and do not have, so you murder. God will never let me do or have fill in the blank. God, you're just never going to let me do this. You're never going to let me have that. At that moment, we can either surrender or explode, right? God, I want this. You don't seem to want it for me. You're not, you're not giving it to me. This thing that I want, this thing that I want to do, we can either surrender or we can explode. Now, it's really easy to say, well, yeah, I just surrender all my desire to God. It's very easy to say it's a little more difficult to live out, isn't it? To daily surrender our desires to God. Like uh, we heard this morning, three-year-old in the kitchen, um, 
child in a checkout line? May I say, at this point in life, I rather enjoy watching the little guy in the checkout line. Like, let's see how mom, dad deal with this one. Why is it that they put the candy bars down this low? Why, why is that? I wonder. So Junior can, like, eyeball right there. Um, Almond Joy, by the way, would be number one pick. Um, and what a teaching moment that is. I want that. No, you can't have that. Little Johnny can either surrender or explode, right? It, I do remember. I recall those days. Um, parent knows why we can't do that. Now we don't have a dollar to spend on that or we're going home to eat or you know what? You just eat way too much sugar as it is. Whatever. Try to explain that to Junior. It ain't going to fly. Like, they're not looking for a really good reason. They just want that almond joy or whatever Junior likes. That's a teaching moment. It's a teaching moment for the child. I think more so it's a teaching moment for the parent, isn't it? And what a picture of our relationship with God, which was already expressed this morning in testimonies. Uh, what a picture of, of our relationship with God, the disciple and their Savior. God, I want that. You know, no, that's, that's not best for you. That's not what I've got in store for it, but I want it. Well, um, let me try to explain to your little heart why, but I want it, right? God, you'll never let me have that. You'll never let me do that. You desire and do not have, so you murder. Now, is that literal or is that metaphorical? Volumes have been written about both positions, Indeed, there were some in James' church who were zealots, who uh, felt completely justified, and others who felt completely justified uh, in killing Romans because look what the Romans are doing. They're obviously, obviously anti-God. And yet we can also desire and not have and kill somebody's reputation, kill somebody's relationship, kill somebody's joy, Right? I think James' point is the point he made in chapter 1, verse 20. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteous uh, requirements of God. Our anger, our frustration, our fits never accomplish God's purposes. I want that. God's not letting me have it. How about asking, God, what do you have for me? I'm sure it's way better than this almond joy, right? God, what do you have for me? James' point, you have your unf unfulfilled desires. You have, and it, you don't get it right away, and so you murder, tear people up. Our uncontrolled desires, our unfulfilled desires, and third, our selfish desires. Our selfish desires. Last part of verse 2 and 3. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. We can either ask our flesh what it wants, right? Which it's screaming, this is what I want. I want that almond joy, by the way. Now I'm going to go get me one as soon as we're done here. Um, <laughs> We can ask our flesh what it wants, or we can ask God what he wants, right? God, what do you have? God, would you allow your passion to be my passion? Which, which defines my prayer life? Which defines your prayer life? Asking our flesh what it wants, and then twisting God's arm, or asking God, God, what do you have for me? God, what do you want? What do you want for me? You covet, can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You don't have because you do not ask. You don't have the things that your heart truly desires, truly longs for. Peace with God, peace with others, the joy of the Lord, the things that our hearts truly long for. You don't have those things because you're looking for them in the wrong places, right? You don't have the things that truly, that your heart truly longs for because you're looking in the wrong places, because you've got wrong motives to spin it on your own passions. 
God, I want fill in the blank versus God, I need wisdom. God, I need wisdom. Maybe before we pray for anything tomorrow morning, we ought to say, Father, I need wisdom. I need your wisdom. I don't even know what to ask for. Father, I don't. My flesh is screaming, yeah, we want more of this, more of that, a little better of this and that. But God, I need, I need. Father, I need your wisdom to even know what to ask for. Does that make sense? Huh? So often our hearts just cry out, I want this, like the little guy in the checkout line. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You're not asking God. James is saying you're not asking God what he wants for you. You're, you're having these blow-ups amongst yourselves because you just want your way. You're not asking God what he wants, how to do things his way. Reminded of Jesus' words in John 14, verses 13, 14. Ask anything in my name, and I will do it. Ask anything in my name, and I will do it. Oh, I want an almond joy. Ask anything in my name, which is his desire, his purpose for his glory, right? When we ask for anything in his name, it's for his glory, his purposes, his desire. And then Jesus said, I will do it, right? Because it's according to his will. God, give me wisdom. Show me. Show me your will. Conflict with ourselves. Do we want a life? Do we just want a life that gives us pleasure? Or do we want a life that gives God glory? That's a foundational question, isn't it? Do we, do we want a life that just gives us pleasure? Or do we want a life that gives God glory? What do we do when our desires and our passions aren't met? Do we just push harder and harder and I'm going to try more and more? Do we press harder or are we able to surrender our desire to God? God, I want this thing. And I can make up all kinds of excuses why I ought to get that thing or do that thing. And yet, Lord, I surrender my desire to you. Would you allow your desire to be my desire? Psalm 37, 4 comes to mind. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we delight in him, our desires become his desires. We delight ourselves in ourselves, and God's not going to give us the desire of our heart because our desires of our heart are crooked. But when we delight ourselves in him, he will give us the desires of our heart because it, when we're delighted in him, his glory... His purposes are our delight. That was free. That wasn't even in the notes. And last, James deals with, we are in conflict with God. In conflict with God. Verses 4, 5, 6. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Addressing that whole thing of, uh, why can't we just be in the good graces of the culture? Verse 5, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that is made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Strong rebuke, strong rebuke, you adulterous people, you unfaithful people, James says. You're unfaithful to the commitment to the faith. You came to Christ and said, Jesus, it's all about you. Thank you for what you've done for me, and my life is yours. As we used to say, uh, Lord, you fill in the details. I'm just going to sign the bottom. It's, it's all about what you want, right? That, that's where they started, by faith, and now they are an unfaithful people, unfaithful to the commitment to the faith that they had in Christ whole book of Hosea is about that, the Old Testament prophet. First, James deals with friendship with the world. Friendship with the world. The world, I think, could be defined as all that which does not bow a knee to the lordship of Jesus. Everything in the world, everything in our culture that does not, that refuses to bow a knee to the lordship of Jesus. Where sin is tolerated, 
Sin is accommodated. Oftentimes today, sin is celebrated. John said the same thing, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You love the world, then you don't love the Father. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. You're serving one or the other, right? James says, wake up and realize you desire more to, to be more like the world than you desire to be like Christ. In verse 5, why does the scripture say he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us? James is probably just kind of summarizing the Old Testament uh, statements, truth that, that God uh, is jealous for us. God earnestly desires to walk with you. God earnestly desires to walk with you and with me. Do we desire earnestly to walk with him? Friendship with the world. Yes, we all want the world to like us, right? We all want to be popular. We all want to be looked on. But when, when the world takes a right turn and Jesus takes a left turn, may we walk with him, right? May we walk with him. And the world's taking some turns today, huh? May we. When, it's, when there's a separation between the culture and Christ, may we stand with Christ. Hurricane-proof faith, as was mentioned already this morning. Friendship of the world, and lastly, friendship with the Lord. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Thank you, James, for, for finally giving us a, an upbeat note. Next week, we're going to look. James is going to get into the... the, the uh, Solution to the problem, but here he just deals with the root of the problem. God extends a promise to all who will receive it, his grace. Whoever will receive his grace. Can we admit that God's standards are high? Thankfully, thankfully, who wants to serve a God whose standards are less than mine? I'm thankful that we serve a God whose standards are high. God's standards are very, very high. God's grace is. God's grace is sufficient to enable us to walk in his standards, right? God's standards are high, but his grace, he gives more grace. He gives grace to walk in his standards and enables us, empowers us to walk according to his standards. God opposes the proud. He opposes the self-sufficient. He opposes those who say, God, don't need you. I'm good. I'm good. Got it all together myself. God opposes the self-sufficient. God gives grace to those who understand that they absolutely are dependent upon him. Conflict with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That is what your heart longs for. That is what my heart longs for, to be at peace with God. Huh? Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Friend, God invites you to walk in peace with him. God invites you to walk in peace with him. That's grace, right? That's grace. His standards are high. I don't measure up. I know you don't measure up. He measures up. Walk in his grace. God invites you to walk in peace with him. I just want to close with, I think, the obvious question that this passage asks are we willing to face the root of the problem? Are we willing to face the root of the problem? The root of the problem is the problem of the root, right? The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Are we willing not to blame everything? Why are you guys fighting? I think James, church members, many of them would have said, well, we're fighting because he did this or she said that or because things are. No, James says, no, no, you're the problem, right? It's our hearts. It's our hearts running with the passions that should not be there. May God give us grace to face the heart of the issue. God, what is there in me that's stern? What is there? If I'm upset with everybody, if I'm picking a fight with everybody, God, what is it in my heart that's creating the tension? A conflict with myself, I'm going to be at conflict with others. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for clear instruction from your word. Thank you for a 
strong challenge through the Apostle James. Lord, we don't want to be we don't want to be tagged an unfaithful people who are unfaithful to the commitment that we've made to you. Lord, we want to watch our heart with all vigilance, knowing that everything in life, how we respond to everything in life, is predicated by the condition of our hearts. So, Lord, may we, maybe not just look about and point fingers at this one and that one and the government and the culture at large. Lord, may we look at the root of the problem, our own hearts. May our hearts first be at peace with you. Then may we be at peace with ourselves. May we deal rightly. God, would you give us grace to deal rightly with the passions that swirl about us, whether it's passion for popularity or position or pleasure. Father, would you give us grace to deal and the wisdom to deal with our own hearts that we might be at peace with others. Father, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of homework to do. Would you, would you give us the courage to look at our own hearts, to watch our hearts with all diligence? And for that, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.